Tonight, we are going to talk about the second part in topic 7.8, hyperbolic functions. You already know what is an hyperbolic function, its shape and the domain range, definitions, derivative, and the integration formula that involves the hyperbolic function. Another thing that you need to know is the formula sheet. This is the directive of the hyperbolic function, six of them. Tonight, we're going to talk about the inverse of the hyperbolic function. If you know the function, you can always obtain its inverse as long as the function is restricted to one one. The hyperbolic function, for example, the uh, hyperbolic function of sine, uh, which is this graph, it is obviously an one one function however for an hyperbolic cost let us look at the hyperbolic cost function a hyperbolic cost function which is this shape is not one one therefore you have to restrict the domain of the hyperbolic cost therefore when we define the inverse hyperbolic cost we only take the uh, positive side of the hyperbolic cost so we define the uh, re domain restricted hyperbolic cost to be defined for x that is larger than zero. Then the hyperbolic cost function become one one. Therefore, we can define the inverse of it. Likewise, for the hyperbolic secant function is not one one. So we would then take the um, functions of the hyperbolic cost to be defined, sorry, the hyperbolic secant to be defined for x larger than zero in order to define its um, inverse. For the hyperbolic cost secant, the function is one one. Therefore, there's no restrictions in the uh, domain of the hyperbolic uh, cost secant function. So these are the graph of the hyperbolic uh, cosecant function and the graph of the hyperbolic secant function. So as I mentioned, hyperbolic secant functions, you have to restrict the x to be positive. Then you reflect the hyperbolic secant function about the y equals x. Then you obtain the inverse of the hyperbolic secant function. The hyperbolic cos function is like this. Uh, when you restrict the x to be only positive, <clears throat> then you reflect it about the y equals x axis, then you get the inverse of the hyperbolic cost. Likewise, you can also obtain the shape of the uh, inverse hyperbolic tangent function, which is like this. This is the graph of the hyperbolic um, the graph of the inverse of hyperbolic tangent and these two are respectively the graph showing the inverse of the hyperbolic cotangent and the inverse of the hyperbolic cosecant. Now the idea here is like this, you have six different uh, hyperbolic function and you know the shape of this hyperbolic function and also the range and domain. Therefore, in principle, you can easily deduce the shape of the inverse hyperbolic function and its range and, and its range and domain. Uh, let us take a look at say the um, cosecant function, the hyperbolic cosecant function, say this one. Okay, so let us begin from scratch and then uh, show you how you can derive the properties of the hyperbolic function for a hyperbolic cosecant and its inverse from uh, scratch. So we first look at the definitions of the hyperbolic cosecant function. Say um, we have a hyperbolic cosecant function is defined as a half of exponential e my plus exponential plus. So by looking at the definition of the hyperbolic cosecant, then 
that you can easily construct its graph. You don't really need a Mathematica or Wolfram Alpha to show you the graph of hyperbolic cosecant if you know how to construct them from scratch. Construct it by first drawing the exponential function, and then you reflect the exponential function about the y equals x axis. Then you'll be able to obtain its reflections. This is e minus x. Then you add the two graphs together, divided by half, then you will get the uh, hyperbolic cosecant. Specifically, you look at the first point here when x equals to zero, then the hyperbolic cosecant will go to this point, which is just equals to one. And the graph is known to be uh, approaching e power x when x is large, and the graph of hyperbolic cosecant is approaching e power minus x when x become very negative. So the graph would start from here and then it will approach the values of um, exponential function uh, when x become very large and so is the um, graph of the hyperbolic cosecant. It will approach to a half of expo the half of exponents of minus x when x become negative. So what I have done here is that I have just constructed the shape of the hyperbolic cosecant um, from the definition of the exponential function and exponential of negative x. So then the next thing I want to do is I want to construct the inverse of it. That is the inverse of the hyperbolic cosecant. In order to construct the inverse of hyperbolic cosecant, I first have to restrict the functions to be 1, 1. Therefore, I choose to restrict the cosecant function to be defined only on the uh, x larger than 0. So I define x to be uh, positive. Uh, then what I would get is only this part of the graph. That I highlight it. Then what I'm going to do is I'm going to make the reflections about the y equals to x axis. So this is y equals to x axis. Then I'm going to reflect the, uh, hyper the uh, hyperbolic cosecant about this. Then I'll get the reflections. So how do I get the reflection? First point is to uh, look at this point. This point is at 0, 1. So when it's reflected about the y equals x axis, this point will be reflected onto here, which is 1, 0. So the graph of the inverse of hyperbolic cosecant must be going to this point. And then um, let me see how I should construct the function. So then the function would be like this. Um, let me see. Uh, um, when x goes to very, very negative, then um, this point would be approaching the values of minus infinity and our y goes to zero. So when you reflect this graph about here, what do you get? Um, can you see the reflections? Um, I think it would be like, yeah, it would be like this. So this part of the graph, where it tends to minus infinity, when x goes to minus, when it tends to zero, when x goes to minus infinity, then it will be reflected as this, okay? So that is the graph of the inverse of the hyperbolic clause. Then um, I would also expect it to um, be like this. So this part of the graph is when x goes to positive infinity. When x goes to positive infinity, then it just shoot to uh, infinity. So the graph will be just looking like this. We'll keep on increasing. So this is the graph of the uh, inverse of hyperbolic secret. So let's see if the graph have the same shape as given in the slide. Okay, so I think I was um, not very careful when I draw the graph again. Um, that is, the graph has only a positive value. So I think 
something is not right. Um, yeah, what happened to this? So what I'm looking at is that I think I'm looking at the wrong graph. See what I have done wrong here is that I actually, when I make a reflections, I should actually only take in this part. I should not reflect this part of the graph. So when this part of the graph is reflected into here, you've got this. So um, I have to uh, redraw my reflections again. So this should be off, okay? So that shouldn't be here. So the correct way of making the reflection of the hyperbolic cosecant function is only to reflect this part of the graph about y whose x-axis to obtain this part of the graph. So the correct um, reflections is the one that is shown here, okay? So what I'm trying to show you is how you would be able to obtain the graph of the inverse of hyperbolic cost by knowing the definition of the hyperbolic cost and the domain uh, that makes the hyperbolic cost um, one one. So uh, once you have um, finished making the reflections, then the next thing you want to do is to write down the range and the domain of the um, inverse hyperbolic x. Now, what is the inverse hyperbolic cos x range and domain? This could be easily obtained from the range and domains of the hyperbolic cosecant. So here, when we construct the hyperbolic cosecant, we have already restricted its domain to R. Uh, we have already restricted the domains of hyperbolic cosecant to x that is uh, larger than zero. Therefore, the range of the inverse of it must be then uh, the same as the domain of the hyperbolic cosecant, which is defined to be one one. So that is just equals to all the values of x um, to infinity. So that is the range of the uh, inverse hyperbolic uh, cosecant, which is beginning from here all the way up to infinity. So that represents the range of the inverse of hyperbolic cosecant. Then by looking at the graph of the um, hyperbolic cosecant as well, you can easily write down the range of it. The range of the hyperbolic cosecants is starting from 1 up to infinity. So this is then translated into the domain of the inverse of the hyperbolic cosecant, which is just 1 infinity. So that is how you determine the range and domain of the um, inverse hyperbolic cosecant of x. So the point here is that once you can uh, do this, that is making a reflections of the original hyperbolic cosecant to obtain the graph of its inverse, then you can easily deduce the range and domain for the inverse function. And if you know how to do it for, say, for the hyperbolic sign, for the hyperbolic cos, we can then apply it to the um, to obtain the inverse of the hyperbolic secant, the inverse of hyperbolic tangent, inverse of hyperbolic cotangent, the inverse of hyperbolic uh, cosecant. And after we have discussed the constructions of hyperbolic functions, the inverse of the hyperbolic functions graph from the original hyperbolic functions, its range and domain, then we are going to discuss the identity for the inverse of hyperbolic function. Now, similarly, if you can recall what we have discussed this morning, we also talk about identity that is obeyed by the hyperbolic function. Here, you have a set of identity that is obeyed by the hyperbolic functions. The inverse hyperbolic functions obeys 
a sort of like simpler identity. We are going to talk only about three different uh, identities obeyed by the inverse hyperbolic function. It's actually quite a simple uh, identity to remember. Let's see if I can write this down uh, using the memory. So one of the uh, identity is like this. The identity for the um, hyperbolic inverse of x. So this is um, equals to see a uh, sine uh, function is sine. If you take the uh, one over sine, then this is a um, cosecant x. Uh, one over cos of x is uh, sec cos. X. Okay, I need this to remind me what is the um, arc sine. So arc sine is related to the uh, one over arc sine. Well, there's no one over arc sine, but um, you have call secant hyperbolic call secant. So the hyperbolic the inverse of the hyperbolic sign is related to the inverse of hyperbolic cosecant through a very simple relationship. The relationship is not in this form. The relationship is that um, inverse of hyperbolic sign X is the equals to the inverse of the hyperbolic uh, cosecant of one over x. So that is a difference. Okay, so you were thinking they are related like this kind of relationship, but this is not true. Uh, it's a bit weird, but it can be easily um, proven uh, later on. So the first identity of the inverse of the hyperbolic sign is this. The second uh, identity would be the identity that involves hyperbolic cosecant inverse is equals to um, secant inverse. Well, not secant inverse, but the uh, inverse of the hyperbolic cosecant with an argument of one over x. So that is the second identity. The third identity that relates the hyperbolic function is the uh, tangent, the tangent version. That is the inverse of hyperbolic tangent of x is equal to uh, the hyperbolic cotangent of the inverse of the hyperbolic cotangent of one over x. Uh, you find that sometimes I, I make confusions when I want to spell out the name of the inverse of the hyperbolic uh, tangent or whatever. The name of the hy inverse hyperbolic function sometimes uh, is very lengthy. So I often uh, pronounce it wrongly. So these are the three identity that relates the inverse of the hyperbolic function. And let me check first before I proceed. Yeah, I think the, the identities are correctly written down. Let us spend just a little bit of time to prove this very simple relationship that is the uh, inverse of the hyperbolic sine function is equal to the inverse of the hyperbolic cosecant function of one over x. So let's see how uh, we go about proving this. Okay, so we start off from uh, this expression. Cosecant, inverse cosecant of x. So what I do here is that I would first take the cosecant Cosecant 
function of this. Do you know what I'm doing? So here is a uh, process where I first have an inverse of hyperbolic cosecant. Then I slot this inverse of hyperbolic cosecant into the hyperbolic cosecant function. So this is hyperbolic cosecant function, cosec h. Uh, sometimes uh, this hyperbolic cosecant h is also written as csh. Okay. So sometimes I write it like this. Sometimes I write it like this. But they all refer to the same thing. So when I do this, what I get, I get x. Right. But uh, once I have obtained that, then what I'm going to do is that I'm going to take again uh, the inverse of hyperbolic of sine on of sine. So when I do that, uh, let's see what I would get. Uh, Okay, so I think I have to uh, begin this over again. I think my step may not be entirely correct. I think uh, maybe I should refer to the slides. It would be better in that way so that I don't uh, commit um, stupid mistakes. So let me start again. I'm going to prove that the inverse of the hyperbolic secant function is the same as the inverse of uh, So let me say it again. I lost track of what I said. I think just now I wrote the wrong thing as well. Uh, so just now I was writing the yeah, hyperbolic sign. Yeah, I think this, this is correct. So I'm checking my writing. In case I have made some mistakes, I must correct it. Okay, now I think I made the mistakes I confirmed. Now I have to apologize for writing down the wrong uh, identities for the uh, inverse hyperbolic function. So I was writing down that the, these statements, this statement and these statements, and only these statements is correct, whereas the other two statements is not right. Now I think it's correct. The hyperbolic line no, is not correct. So I have to begin over again. I'm sorry to have permitted the stupid mistakes. Okay, I'm going to do it over again. There is a set of um, identity that is obeyed by the inverse of the three, of the hyperbolic function. The first one is that the inverse of hyperbolic secant function is equal to the inverse of the hyperbolic cost function. They are related by uh, these statements. Uh, then the cosecant, the inverse of the hyperbolic cosecant function is related to the inverse of the hyperbolic sine function for this. The inverse of the hyperbolic cotangent function is related to the inverse of hyperbolic tangent function through these three identities. Okay, so this identity can be easily proven. Let's look at how you prove this. I'm going to try this again in my second attempt. So let me start with the uh, 
hyperbolic cosecant of 1 over x. So let me check. Okay, so I'll begin from these very simple statements. So here I'm going to take the second of the inverse of hyperbolic cosecant of one over x. And by definition, this is equal to, see here, the definitions of the hyperbolic second is one over hyperbolic cos x. This is the definitions of the a hyperbolic second function. So if that is the case, then I can write this to be one over hyperbolic cos of hyperbolic cos of one over x. So when I write from here to here, I am simply using the definitions of the hyperbolic second function, which is one over hyperbolic cos x. Once I have written down this, then this can be easily done, seen to be the hyperbolic cos acting on the inverse of hyperbolic cos of 1 over x. So this simply gives you back 1 over x. And that is just equals to x. So I have done, what I have done so far is that I have shown that the second hyperbolic secant of the inverse of hyperbolic cosecant is just equals to s. And I take one more step by taking the inverse of hyperbolic secant on both sides. So I'm going to take the inverse of the hyperbolic secant on the left and the inverse of hyperbolic secant on the right. And what I would get is this. This inverse of hyperbolic secant acting on hyperbolic secant, and what is left is this. Right. So uh, left hand side now become hyperbolic cos of one over x, and the right hand side is then um, inverse of the hyperbolic secant of x. Mind you, this can also be written as um, x, and you have this. You can either write it in this form or in this form. So that proves the first identity for the trigonometric function as seen in the table 7.9. Now, I'm not going to show you how you prove this, but the similar tricks would be applied to show the other two identity. You should try to do this yourself. It should be simple. It's a good exercise. Then the next thing we want to talk about is to obtain the derivative of the inverse of the hyperbolic function. There are a total of six inverse hyperbolic function, uh, hyperbolic sine, hyperbolic cos, inverse hyperbolic cos, inverse hyperbolic tangent, inverse hyperbolic cotangent, inverse hyperbolic secant function, and the inverse of hyperbolic cos secant function. So there are a total of six inverse hyperbolic function, and we are going to ask how to obtain the derivative of each of them. So I'm going to show you first the process of obtaining the derivative of the inverse of hyperbolic sine function. To obtain the derivative of the inverse of the function can be proceed by using the formula that we have been discussing many, many times. That is, you can obtain the derivative of the inverse of the function by taking one over derivative of the original function evaluated at x 
set to the expressions of the inverse of the uh, function. Here, we will take the f to be hyperbolic sine. Then uh, we are asking what is the derivative of the. Okay, so I think I have to make some corrections here. We are going to take the f, the function, as the hyperbolic sine. And then we ask the question what is the ddx? D the x of the inverse, which is the D the x of the inverse of the hyperbolic uh, sine function. So in order to obtain the derivative of the inverse of hyperbolic sine, you just have to first calculate the derivative of the hyperbolic sine, then replace the derivative the x in the derivative uh, by the inverse of it. So this can be easily proceed by writing down the derivative of d dx of the uh, inverse, uh, d dx of the hyperbolic sine. So if f is hyperbolic sine, then df dx is then equals to cosecant. hyperbolic cosecant of x. So this is a very simple relationship that relates the sine, hyperbolic sine, to the hyperbolic force function. And you can check this relationship by referring to the formula sheets. So here you can find the formula sheets that say d dx of hyperbolic sine is just the hyperbolic cos. Then uh, I'm going to write this down. d dF of dx, d dF, sorry, d f dx is then equals to hyperbolic cos of x, where I'm going to replace x by the expressions of the inverse of the function. Here, the inverse of the function is just the inverse of the, uh, sorry, the inverse function here is the inverse of the hyperbolic sign. Therefore, I'm going to replace the expression of x by this whole expression. This then translates into 1 over hyperbolic cos of inverse hyperbolic x. It looks a bit complicated, but actually it's not. What you do here is just simply replace the x by this. So now the derivative of the inverse of hyperbolic sine function is then equals to this. So what is the right hand side? You can actually see this quite straightforwardly by uh, making some simplification to this expression. So here you have a hyperbolic cos, you have the inverse of hyperbolic sign. So somehow if you can uh, convert this function uh, into a common uh, expression, then you're able to simplify this. So in order to proceed, what you have to do is to try to express hyperbolic cos into a form that contains only hyperbolic sign. So how are you going to convert the hyperbolic cos into the hyperbolic sign? The trick here is by referring to the identity that we discussed this morning. The set of identity we discussed on this morning is written here. So here you have the left hand side table 7.6 and then from here you can easily find a very simple relationship that relates the hyperbolic uh, cos and hyperbolic sign. Uh, this is not the relationship that we are looking for. We should be looking at this. This relationship 
will relate the square of hyperbolic cos and the square of hyperbolic sine. So uh, we are going to write this now. Uh, that is, now let me show you the way how to remember this. You have, say, the identity for cos of square x and cos of sine square x. This is the trigonometric version of the identity. You can write down the hyperbolic uh, function version of this identity by simply replace the square inside by negative of um, hyperbolic sine square, whereas the rest you just um, write down the corresponding uh, hyperbolic version. For example, under this uh, translation, then for the hyperbolic cos, I have the hyperbolic, sorry, for the cos square terms in the trigonometric identity, I have cos square x instead. And here, uh, instead of plus of um, sine square, I have a minus sine square. So I replace the sine square x by minus hyperbolic sine square of x, and this will be one. So this is the simple way to write down the identity for the hyperbolic functions by referring to the more familiar trigonometric identity. So now I can easily con express the hyperbolic cost in terms of a hyperbolic sign through these very simple relationships. So now um, I have one over hyperbolic cos. Hyperbolic cos is nothing but just the square root of one plus the square of hyperbolic sign. And the arguments of x is just simply the argument that appears here. So what goes into here is this expression because I'm talking about cos of something. Hyperbolic cos of something is this. Then the something should go into here. So I have then um, hyperbolic inverse of x. So anyway, when I go from this line of equation to this line of equation, I have made use of the identity that relates the hyperbolic cos to the hyperbolic sign using this very simple relationship. Then uh, the x that appears in this identity is this argument of the inverse of hyperbolic sign. So now you have hyperbolic sign, you have inverse of hyperbolic sign, then this would then give you one over square root of one plus x squared. So one plus x, one plus x squared, yeah. So what I'm saying here is that hyperbolic sine square of the inverse of x is just x squared, okay? So that is as simple as I would say. So we have then finally proved that the d dx of the inverse of hyperbolic sine is given by 1 over uh, square root of 1 plus x squared. So that, that is a simple proof of my um, results. Now, once we have done this, then let us try to do a few more things based on this preliminary result. What I'm going to do next is I'm going to show you this. If I were to um, take the derivative instead of um, x, I'll take the derivative of x over a, where a is a constant. And what would that be? If I were to take that derivative, I'm going to apply the so-called chain rule. Let me call y the x over a, and then this d the x of inverse of hyperbolic sine of x over a would then be written as this. And this is just the d dy of inverse hyperbolic sine y dy dx. 
Again, when I write down the right hand side of the equations, I am using the chain rule. Then I know what is the dy of the inverse of um, hyperbolic sine. This is just one over square root of one plus y squared. And dy dx is simply equals to one over a because y is x over a so dy dx is just one over a therefore i have come to this expression that the d dy d dx of hyperbolic sine of u over a not u over a x over a is just equals to one over uh, a times one plus x squared over a squared so why is x over a so y square is just equal to x square over a so i can make this um, simplified further uh, that will become a square plus x square in a square root yeah so that is the next generalizations of this relationship here the constant that's added to x squared is one uh, then i show that if you replace x by x over a then you can obtain the generalized uh, differentiation result of d dx of uh, of sine of x over a it is just equals to this right so when x equal when a equals to one this result would then reduce to this result therefore this result is a more generalized version of this derivative which has a constant of one inside the argument of the square root so once you have obtained this one what can you do next the next thing you want to do is to translate this differentiation result into an integral form so from here i'm going to take the definite i'm going to take the indefinite uh, integrations on both sides of this equation in other words i'm going to take the antiderivative of this equation so to take the antiderivative of the equation what i do is i prepare the indefinite integral operator then I slot in both sides of equations into the indefinite integral operator. This will give me the dx of the inverse of hyperbolic sine x over a. Here I've got 1 over square root of a squared plus a squared. Okay, so let me look at the left hand side. Now, what is the left hand side? The left hand side is actually the inverse of the hyperbolic sine function x over a plus and constant and the right hand side is just the indefinite integrations of the function one over square root of x squared over a squared so this is a result that is obtained from the differentiation of the equations shown here the conclusion is that if you have an integration in the form of 1 over square root of a squared plus x squared, the indefinite integration result is simply expressed as a function of the inverse of hyperbolic sine of x over a. So that is the result that is shown on the graph here. Okay, so this is the result that is the integrations of the function 1 over square root of a square plus u square. And this result is just being derived um, in the slides here. And this equation is coming from this result. Okay.
So I have shown you basically the directive of the inverse of hyperbolic sign and how the integration versions is obtained from this. If you can do this for the inverse of hyperbolic sign, then you can apply the similar tricks to obtain the directive of the inverse hyperbolic cost and inverse hyperbolic tangent. And then from this result, you can easily write down the integrations version of them, which is the equation two and three in table 7.15. But I have not actually told you um, how to obtain the uh, derivative of this arc cost, uh, arc, uh, inverse hyperbolic cotangent, inverse hyperbolic secant, and the inverse of hyperbolic uh, cos secant. You can actually try to do this yourself by uh, using uh, any method or trying to see if you can obtain the differentiation result by using the identities from table uh, 7.9. So I'll leave this as exercise to you, that is to try to prove the result here and also uh, prove this result here. The principle is that if you can understand how you arrive at this result, you should be able to do it for other uh, inverse hyperbolic function. Uh, so the next thing we want to talk about is the uh, derivative. Well, is the example. Okay, so let us look at example. Okay, let us look at example two, uh, integrating uh, two the x squared of three plus x uh, evented between uh, zero and one. There are two ways you solve the um, example three. Uh, this is the slide that that you have uh, in the hard copy of the lecture notes. Uh, I have amended these slides slightly so that um, the I have added in these alternative solutions in addition to the uh, original versions of the solution. So let's see how you can do this um, example. So the integrations to be conducted is in the form of 2 dz, well not, 2 dx of the square root of Three plus four x squared. And you're going to integrate it between zero and one. Now, the first thing to do is to try to cast this integration into the form that is in the form of a square plus b square. I think that is what you would want to do. You would want to see how to transform this integration into this form. Why is that so? Because uh, you have a formula for this integration in the form of one over a square plus x square. So this is a square plus x square. So how do you do that? Actually, it can be easily done. You look at three plus four x squared. You pull out the four. Um, then you have x squared uh, plus three over four. Okay. So then when you take the square root, then you have this square root. So that would be just equal to two of x squared plus three over four squared, right? So then this would then be written as um, 2 dx divided by times square root of x squared plus 3 over 4 squared between 0 and 1. Then 2 can be cancelled off. 
So now you have this very simple relationship that relates um, x squared plus a squared, integrating from 0 to 1, where a is just your 3 over 4. Then the integrations formula that has been derived earlier on is like this. Right? So you look at the first equations. The integration in this form is just a hyperbolic sine of u over a. So here it can be easily um, integrated. This will be just equals to inverse of hyperbolic sine of x over a and it's to be integrated between 0 and 1. So this is just the inverse of 1 over a minus um, the inverse of the hyperbolic sign at 0 over a. So hyperbolic sign of inverse hyperbolic sign of 0 is just equals to uh, what? Equals to 0. So you can check this yourself. Inverse of hyperbolic um, sign is should be zero. Uh, how you can be sure that it's zero? There are two ways of, uh, of writing down these uh, equations. First is you can try to ask um, Mathematica, or you can recall it from the shape of the hyperbolic sign. Okay, so for the y equals to hyperbolic sign, then the function, it looks like this, right? Then when you reflect it about the y plus x axis, then the shape of the uh, inverse should be something like this. So this is the shape of the inverse of x. With this, then you always remember that the either hyperbolic sign or inverse of it go to the point of zero. Therefore, you are sure that uh, this term is actually zero. So the answer is simply equals to the inverse hyperbolic sine of 1 over a, where a is 3 over 4. So that is the result of the uh, inverse of hyperbolic sine of 3 over 4. So let's check if this answer is correct. Yeah, uh, 2 over square root of 3. Uh, yeah, I'm sorry. I think here this is a. Uh, so a a square. Yeah, I think I have made some um, stupid mistake again. A square is three over four. This should be identified as um, a square instead of a. So a is then equal to square root of three over two. Therefore, this is just um, square root of four over three, which is just inverse. Of hyperbolic of 2 over 3. 2 over square root of 3. Yeah, so square root of 3. So that um, demonstrates to you how to calculate the uh, example 3. The other question in example 3 is slightly more involved is calculating the integrations. Let me see, uh, would I have to go further? Okay, we have to proceed a little bit further. Uh, let us try to see how you obtain the values of inverse of hyperbolic sine of 2 over square root of 3. Now, you can actually answer this question quite easily by using um, the software which is the Wolfram Alpha. So you call out Wolfram Alpha. Let's try this ourselves here. I let me demonstrate to you how you can calculate this uh, Wolfram Alpha. So you just say, uh, hyperbolic sign, S-I-N-H. Then the argument will be 2 over square root of 3. So that is how you obtain the arc of hyperbolic sign of 2 over square root of 3. So the answer would be an 
uh, number, which is kind of lengthy, uh, 0.98 or something like that. But can you um, express this number in a more uh, explicit manner? You can actually try to do this um, by using the definitions of the inverse of hyperbolic sine. Let this call Q to be inverse of hyperbolic sine of 2 over square root of 3. Then when you take the hyperbolic sine on both sides, then you get 2 over square root of 3. Then you write down the definitions of the hyperbolic sine of Q, which is defined as half of E power Q minus E power of minus Q. This is just the definition of the hyperbolic uh, Q. So you can then uh, solve these equations uh, in this manner. You let U to uh, represent E Q, then this will be U minus one over U equals to four over square root of three. So this will then be converted into an quadratic equations of U. Then you make some rearrangement for over square root of three U minus one. This quadratic equation can then be factorized and you can find its roots, uh, say u minus u1 and u minus u2. So how do you find the root of these quadratic equations? The root of the quadratic equations is simply equals to minus b. So this is b squared minus um, square root of b squared minus 4ac over 2a. So this is a formula for calculating the root of an quadratic equation. So I would then write down the expressions for a b square. Here b square will be 16 over 3 plus minus square root of um, b square, which is again 16 over 3 uh, plus 4ac, which is Minus 4ac is just plus 4, then divided by 2. So that would be this number, uh, 16 over 3 plus minus um, 16 over uh, 12, 28 over 3, uh, with and half in the bottom. Well, anyway, it's just a number. However, you find that uh, the u1, let's say you call u1 equals to a positive value. Then the u2, which is um, 16 over 3 minus the square root of 28 over 3, you find that this will become negative. So the u2 cannot be possibly become the solutions because the u is defined as eq. And any exponential function, as we already mentioned, it has to be larger than zero. So if Q is negative or positive, uh, so not Q, uh, U, U is Q, right? So since U is defined to be Q, then U can never be, U can never be less than zero. If U, which is defined as e power q cannot be less than zero, then that means uh, u2 cannot be taken to be a negative number. Therefore, we come to the conclusion that we can only take the positive part of the solution for this quadratic equation, which is just 12 of 16 over 3 plus square root of 28 over 3. So that is e over q, which is just this number. Then the values of Q is easily obtained with the natural log of the half of 16 over 3 plus a square root of 28 over 3. Well, it's a bit messy, but you can actually obtain the exact value for Q, uh, which is the values of the inverse of hyperbolic sine of 2 over 3. So that turns out to be a complicated expression.
but you can express it explicitly as this form, assuming that uh, my calculation is not uh, wrong. So that is the um, expression that I want to say. So maybe I get something wrong here when I try to solve the quadratic equations, but you can check yourself. If it's wrong, then make correction for yourself. Okay, so I think it's a bit late now. Um, it's already 9.33. I do not get any response from the class. I'm just um, no time to explain as much as I can on my screen. And I do not know whether you follow or not what I express here, but it took me a bit of um, brain power to explain to you. So I, before I let you go, just let me give you some advice on uh, mathematics. So I was thinking all the stuff that I discuss in the lecture can be understood. If you follow it yourself very closely, you don't really need to be super intelligent in order to understand all these mathematics. You can try, for example, answer this for yourself, prove the derivative of the, uh, say, hyperbolic sign, and show that this is indeed equals to this answer for yourself from first principle. You don't really need to memorize all this formula. What you need is just sit down and go through the slides all over again. Try to understand every single step. I can assure you that all the single steps that I explain here can be understood. The problem is just that it is a bit lengthy and sometimes people find it very exhaustive to be follow to follow all the argument however if you argue if you follow all these things step by step every single thing that is mentioned in the lecture notes are all understandable so you just need to be patient and to be uh, working harder to understand them okay uh, i am talking about this because i am a little bit worried about what will happen to some of you in the exam hall based on the previous results, uh, based on the results from the previous academic year, uh, I told you already like maybe like 70% of 80% of the class get an F during the exam. So I'm not sure whether this time the results, uh, the, the history will repeat itself or not, but I hope that it would not. Uh, but you can always try to understand all this stuff uh, by going through the lecture notes.